Today I will argue that the central problem with traditional approaches to Iron Age ethnicity is that researchers have mainly focused on macro categories such as Celts, Germans or Iberians. These categories were to a large extent constructs from outsiders like the Romans and had little or no significance for past groups or individuals, at least from an emic perspective. But there were also some smaller groupings called tribal, tribal ethnicities by Romans or ethnic communities by Anthony Smith, which could have functioned as emic categories and which often overlapped with political units. Ethnicity is both an ideology and a practice it is negotiated in the continuous dialectic between objective socio-cultural features and subjective experiences of identity. We need to start by recognizing that ethnic identity is only one of the various identities, so its study cannot be separated from other elements of social construction, such as hierarchy, power, age, or gender. On the other hand, it must be remembered that ethnicity is a matter of degree, and while some ethnic groups are very conscious of their separateness and emphasize it in all manners of ways, for example, through dress or distinctive jewelry, others are less aware of belonging and make no special effort to distinguish themselves. Moreover, ethnic identity does not necessarily mean the same for all the people that share it, and it is probably more relevant to some members of the group than for others. Finally, it is essential to recognize that ethnicity operates on more than one level, and this is the central point of my presentation today. In this sense, any given individual's ethnic affiliation may change according to different circumstances, interlocutors and situations, and interplay with other identifying categories, such as gender, age, or class. As stated above, ethnic affiliation can be expressed at different scales of social organization. There is never a single identity, but multiple superimposed and co-integrated levels whose important change according to the situation. Both in the past and present, different types of loyalties can operate in different spheres without being perceived as contradictory. Individuals, households, and communities are simultaneously members of different larger entities and different networks. The same way as a 21st century person can feel Londoner, English, British, and European at the same time, people in antiquity would have felt attached to their particular household and extended family group, but also to an ethnic community, and sometimes even to larger groupings or federations. To give a practical example, a wealthy farmer, the head of a family, could spend the whole year without leaving the valley where he lived with his relatives, but on a particular occasion or for a special circumstance, he could participate in a tribal assembly or council, like the ones described by Julius Caesar for the Edwi or the Trevery, for example. The autonomy in the social, economic, and ritual sphere does not mean that higher levels of integration did not exist, just as membership of the same group does not invalidate the existence of different experiences of being in the world. Therefore, we need to go beyond the dichotomy between views that only focus on large entities, or at the other extreme approaches that restrict themselves only to the level of the household, but ignore the integration into broader entities. Thus, different nested socio-political and identity levels can be distinguished within and between Iron Age communities, constituting a practical example of the multidimensional and situational character of identity. In the case of late Iron Age gold, for example, it is possible to distinguish five main levels of socio-political aggregation in an ascending order First, households. Secondly, extended family groups. Third, 
sub-ethnic communities, such as the four Pagi that, according to CISA, conform the Helveti, four ethnic communities like Edwi, Helveti, Treveri, Arverni, and many others, and finally, macro categories like the Belgae or the Aquitanians. All these different levels existed at the same time, but their importance in everyday life changed according to circumstances. Moreover, we also need to take into account the existence of a full series of transversal elements which are essential for understanding the functioning of Gallic communities. For example, opposition between different factions at all levels of society, the role of different types of identities such as gender, age or class, clientship relations, or the role of the Druids as mediators in the negotiation of political and private disputes. Therefore, according to the sources, late Iron Age Gallic societies were structured in multiple sapa imposed levels cut across in turn by transversal conflicts between factions and complex networks of alliances and dependencies. Some authors have argued that the pre-Roman peoples were primarily political entities. While true, this assertion, sh assertion should not lead us to underestimate the simultaneous character as ethnic groups, since both elements, the political and the ethnic, complement each other perfectly in processes of collective identity <coughs> construction. Instrumentalist perspectives have underlined the importance of ethnicity when reinforcing socio-political formations, to the point that Dirks and Roymans state that it is politics that define ethnicity and not vice versa. Political identity often overlaps with ethnic identity, and the ancient world from the Greek polis to the Etruscan city-states to the late Iron Age Gallic polities is full of examples of political entities being imbued with a strong group identity. The members of the political community would have seen themselves as members of an ethnic group and in this sense creating a shared identity. These entities can, best can be best defined as politicized ethnic communities. That means ethnic groupings functioning as political entities, as political communities. They had their own ethnic names, went to war, exchanged hostages, and had political and military leaders, as well as political institutions, as, such as the public assembly, the council or senate, and sometimes even the monarchy. We even have some evidence about the existence of originness. An argument that is frequently invoked to deny or downplay the ethnic character of pre-Roman po populations is the well-proven fact that the distribution of material cultural elements does not generally conform to the boundaries described in written sources. For example, through our excellent analysis of the pottery facies, Philippe Barral has convincingly demonstrated the heterogeneity of groups such as the Edwi in terms of material culture. However, assuming that the material culture of a group has to be entirely homogeneous for it to be considered an ethnic entity, is to remain rooted in a profoundly normativistic view of culture similar to the proposals of also such as child in the early 20th century. This concept has already been criticized by leading figures of processual and post-processual archaeology and is now widely discredited in fields such as anthropology. To give two examples, Conant indicated that the Pocot in Kenya had a strong sense of ethnic unity, although aspects such as their settlement patterns or forms of government changed significantly depending on whether they were shepherds on the plain or inhabitants of the highlands. Frederick Barr, for his part, highlighted in his famous book Ethnic Groups and Boundaries that the patterns living on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan saw themselves as belonging to a single ethnic group with specific social boundaries, despite the wide variations in terms of the cultural and social forms they exhibited. A new approach that can prove very helpful for understanding 
the complexity of Iron Age ethnicity is offered by the British sociologist Anthony Smith. This also distinguishes between two uses of the concept of ethnicity. One narrow, which focuses fundamentally on actual or presumed descent, but also a broader one for which he offers a three-part classification in ethnic categories, ethnic networks, and ethnic communities. Ethnic categories are constructs often generated from outside, which group together some populations who share certain elements of common culture and perhaps a particular territory, but we may lack even a name to call themselves by, a myth of common origin, and a sense of ethnic solidarity. Ethnic networks for their part display patterns of shared activities and relations, but rarely a political unit, tending to have a collective name, a mess of common ancestry, and some degree of solidarity, at least among the elites. Finally, ethnic communities could be defined as named and self-defined human populations with myths of common origins, shared historical memories, elements of common culture, and a measure of ethnic solidarity. Usually when people usually when people talk now about a, a definition of ethnicity and they are referring to this third level, ethnic communities, but Smith's proposal uh, gives us better tools to understand the complexity of ethnic ascriptions. If we follow Smith's proposal, we have to agree that when ethnic names appear in Britain sources, we are witnessing one of the three levels described by him. The challenge lies in discerning whether those historic names refer mainly to external conceptualizations applied to groups of people who lack the self-consciousness that was conferred upon them by others, as is the case in ethnic categories. Or on the other hand, they truly reflect an ethnically assumed conscious identity, as in the case of ethnic communities. Running the risk of oversimplifying reality, attempting to apply Smith's classification will result in the assumption that macro categories such as Celts and Germans constitute ethnic categories. Groupings like Belga or Etruscans will refer to ethnic networks. And entities such as Asinians, Helveti, or the Betones represent ethnic communities. Having said this, uh, any search for ethnic communities faces a problem that in most cases our literary references derive from external sources. As we are all well aware from other contexts such as Africa, these external conceptualizations do not necessarily have to be assumed by the groups to which they are applied. It is therefore a matter of trying to clarify insofar as it is possible whether ethnic categories appearing in Roman and Greek texts were simply constructs imposed from outside, or whether they reflected ethnic ethnic realities. Fortunately, we have some isolated epigraphic references that can provide more clues to this question. And two inscriptions stand out in particular. The first is a graffito with the name Elubeite, written in Etruscan characters on a ceramic vessel dated around 300 BC. The name clearly derives from the ethnonym Helveti and constitutes the earliest contemporary mention of a Gallic group, indicated that some kind of Helvetian identity already existed at the end of the 4th century BC, and in this case from an emic perspective. And we had this discussion in the morning with one of the questions talking about this concept of a, a Helvetian identity. The second inscription, Boyos, was found in the late Iron Age opium of Manching in southern Germany, also on a ceramic vessel. It is a personal name derived from the ethnonym Boy, and ma which makes the example very similar to the one above. These two very interesting inscriptions can, uh, to these two very interesting inscriptions, we can also add some other testimonies. For example, the appearance of the legends 
Remo and Medioma on coins that refer to the Remi and the Mediomatric in gold, or an inscription from the 3rd or 2nd century BC that includes the name Rutanie, which seems to refer to the Ruteni of southern Gaul. Of course, these above-mentioned examples do not exclude the existence of cases that involve only an external and an exogenous designation alien to local realities. <clears throat> All that the ethnic entities transmitted by written sources constituted only the upper scale of multiple superimposed identity levels. In fact, many of the recorded ethnic names of the first millennium BC could have been loosely structured, fluid confederations of smaller ethnic communities, such as Nico Reumann has proposed for the case of the Lower Rhine. It is quite possible that certain ethnicities were only expressed occasionally, for example, in periods of crisis or special confrontation with the other. Furthermore, if we look at Caesar's work, for example, we realize that many groups appear in the Velo Gallico only because of their political importance or because they were encountered at a given moment, for example, the Mandubi and their opidum of Alesia. We don't know how many other groups may have existed simultaneously that were not mentioned. In any case, classical authors may not have completely invented the tribal names, but they would have simplified reality, presenting only the tip of the iceberg of a much more complex scenario. A very interesting example can be found in Strabo's description of the Northern Iberian Peninsula. I quote, Know this, as I was saying, is the mode of life of the Highlanders. I mean those whose boundaries mark off the northern sides of Iberia, namely the Galaesians, the Asturians, and the Cantabrians, as far as the Basconians and the Pyrenees. And then he continues, I shrink from giving too many of the names, shunning the unpleasant task of writing them down unless it comports with the pleasure of someone to hear Pleutarans, Baldatans, Alotrigans, and other names still le less pleasing and of less significance than this. As we can see, Strabo explicitly admits that he's listing only some of the main tribal names, deliberately avoiding to mention several others. Be that as it may, all the indication seems to be that a large amount of the ethnonyms transmitted by written sources were not simply an invention of classical authors, but on the contrary, they could reflect indigenous realities. In any case, external definitions are still interesting, given that comparison with the other constitutes an essential element in the formative processes of ethnic identity. Ethnic identities can arise both from insider perceptions and from the views of outsiders subsequently internalized. Although identity constructions in colonial contexts are frequently creations of colonizing powers, such external constructions may also take a reverse path and end up being accepted as a framework by the very communities that have been colonized. And a good Iron Age example is that of the Great Iberians. The profusion of epigraphic references to persons that in the early Gallo Roman period saw themselves as Remi, Treveri, Lingones, etc., shows that in Gaul it was these categories and not the broader ones such as Celts or Gauls that were really significant in people's everyday lives. But in Italy, the main area where Celtic and Mediterranean communities came into contact, there are some early epigraphic references that allude, I'm finishing, yes, that allude to a consciously assumed Celtic identity, such as the inscription Celti, scratched on a 3rd century BC ceramic, or the anthroponic Michel Testra on a book dated to around 500 BC, which has been linked with the ethnic Celtos. Moreover, in the Roman imperial period, we know some authors such as Martial from Hispania or the Gallic Sidonius Apollonaris, for whom the category Celtic did have an identitary value from an ethnic perspective. 
Similarly, in the Iberian Peninsula, we have Latin inscriptions in which persons called Celtius, Celticus or Celt Celtiber appear, which tell us that at least during the Roman era, the esnonym was accepted as an emic label. In relation to the role played by the ethic emic dynamics, we could say that contact with the classical world must have shaped a certain Celtic identity among certain persons in a similar way to, to that in which the natives of North America familiarized themselves with the external name Indians or those of Australia with the term Aborigines. This is my last slide. A broadly similar process can be proposed for the concept of the Germans. While it was this CISA who first applied the term as a macro category to encompass all the people situated to the east of the Rhine, we also know a number of inscriptions from the Roman imperial era in which the term is used as an emic category. On this point, it is very useful to reflect on the explanation given by Tacitus concerning the very history of the name Germans. I quote, the name of Germany is new and a recent application. The first tribes, in fact, to cross the Rhine and expel the Gauls, so no Kaltungri, then bore the name Germans. So little, li little by little, the name, a tribal, not a national name, prevailed until the whole people were called by the artificial name of Germans. In fact, there are several cases in the ancient world of ethnonyms for small groups later applied in a much broader sense. Hellenes, for example, was originally the name of a small ethnic group in Thessaly, and Greeks that of a community in Epirus. On the basis of a passage of Strabo, it is even possible to propose that the term Celts followed a similar evolution. I quote, this then is what I have to say about the people who inhabit the dominion of Narbonites, whom the men of former times named Celtae, and it was from this Celtae, I think, that the Galatae as a whole were by the Greeks called Celti, on account of the fame of the Celtae, or it may also be that the Massaliots, as well as other Greek neighbors, contributed to this result on account of their proximity. According to this version, the name Kelto may have derived from an ethnic group or groups called Kelta in southern France and was then transferred by the Greeks as a collective name for the neighboring populations of temporary Europe. Be that as it may, identity frameworks such as Celts and Germans would have had a merely situational importance in specific circumstances. Since identification with smaller groups like the household, the extended family, or the tribal polity would have been more important in most cases. Thank you for your attention.